So let me start this presentation with a very grand question, which is how do neural networks learn to generalize? We know um, it's a very important question, yet we don't know how to answer. And one plausible explanation that people often have is that during training, neural network discovers useful structures for generalization. One prominent example uh, includes convolutional neural networks, which seems to find filters or edge detectors during the training. And I'm sure you guys have seen illustration like this, where convolutional layer, um, first few layers find these useful structures. So as a first step toward understanding this grand question, we want to answer how edge detectors arise during the training. In fact, we're going to focus on extremely simplified model that captures the essence of such edge detectors. So let me describe the model, which is a um, sparse coding model or sparse coding problem. So to, to define the problem, let v1 up to vd be some unknown basics uh, unknown fixed basis in D dimension. Let's say it's a canonical basis. Then we consider a binary classification of this pair X and Y, where Y is plus minus one label. And X is defined as follows, which is um, random basis vector plus noise. So let me write down some equation here. So X is Lambda, lambda is here is intensity greater than one times this label Y times some random ba basis vector sample, self, sample uniformly from this V1 up to VD plus this Gaussian noise C. Of course, the goal is to predict the label Y given this input vector X. So how do we solve this problem? When the signal strength lambda is quite small, we actually need to denoise this input example to be able to read out the label. In other words, one needs to threshold out the noise in order to recover the label. How can we do that? I propose that one concrete way to do this is the following one hidden layer neural network with value activations. So to see this, assume that B was chosen sufficiently negative about the order of square root of D, which is the uh, maximum of D Gaussians. I mean, minus log square root log D. In that case, this bias together with the ReLU will threshold out this C, the uh, Gaussian noise. And with that, we can, we'll, we'll be able to recover this signal and recover the label Y. So this is going to be our target classifier. Since it's a ReLU network, one hidden layer, it's very natural to ask, uh, parameterize this classifier with one hidden layer ReLU network and try to ask this question. When does gradient descent on this neural network architecture converges to our target network? So, so far, we consider a very canonical classification problem with the sparse coding model and set up this very canonical, just one hidden layer ReLU network. And ask this question, just optimizes, optimizer is chosen at gradient descent. When does it learn to become the target network? Actually, however, we don't understand this question very well. And we're going to describe in the subsequent slides. In fact, there are some evidence that something fundamentally new is happening, and we need to understand those to be able to understand this question. Okay, so let me be more specific. So here's an interesting observation. Well, let's actually simplify the problem even further and say we know the basis v1 up to vd. In that case, uh, the previous ReLU network, we don't have to learn the first layer weights, uh, w's, and we can just replace this basis vector there. 
and the problem becomes extremely simple here, actually very embarrassingly simple. We only have to learn these three parameters, A plus, A minus, and B. So we're almost narrowing down the question to see how the negative bias arises during the training, it's because we want B to be sufficiently negative to be able to threshold out the noise. Okay, then let's re-ask the question from the previous slide and see how gradient descent learns the, these three parameters when you just initialize A zero um, A's uh, randomly and B to be zero. So with sufficiently small step size, so I'm gonna show you the plots of training loss and the bias dynamics and the weights dynamics, in particular, the sum of weights. So with sufficiently small step size, we see this kind of behavior where uh, unsatisfactorily, bias doesn't move. And same thing is actually true, even if you- Maybe wait, slow down and explain the three plots, exactly what's going on. Right, so the first plot is the training, uh, the loss. We're plotting the loss over iteration. And the second plot is the bias. We're plotting the bias B in that uh, neural network. And the third plot is the sum of the second layer weights, A plus plus A minus. Thank you for the question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, perfect, thanks. So when you increase the step size by 10 times again, uh, um, 10 times, you still see that bias is not going negative. But unexpected phenomenon some happens when you increase the step size by another 10 times. When you increase the step size, step size by another 10 times, you see that bias finally moves and becomes negative. But with some bizarre phenomenon, you see that training loss is very non-monotonic. And when you see the weights, A plus plus, A minus, it's oscillating wildly. So from this plot, it seems that threshold unit or the negative bias arises with step size, large step size that leads to some unstable phenomenon. This picture becomes more clear when you plot final bias after training and also final test accuracy as a function of step size eta. So here's the plot. The first plot is bias plot after training. And second plot is test accuracy after training as a function of learning rate eta. As you can see that there is a stark difference between small, smaller learning rates and larger learning rates. You see that for smaller learning rates, you, bias is not moving sufficiently. And as you increase the step size, bias starts to move and that leads to better test accuracy. So from this plot, you can see that, seems that threshold neurons arise with large learning rates and which ties to better test accuracy. I, I would like to emphasize another interesting thing in this plot which is that when you look at the zoom plot, there seems to be there's phase transition phenomenon. So there's some threshold on the step size below which final bias seems to be not moving and after which bias seems to move. The threshold is actually at this quantity a pi over d square, which we're gonna revisit later. So you might ask whether this is specific to this instance of sparse coding. And let me show you plots for more general problems. So I told you that this simplification was with the knowledge of basis and we replaced the first layer weights with the basis. If you don't do that and also train the first layer weights, W case, we see very similar phenomenon. So here's the plot, you see that as you increase on the second plot, the bias plot, um, as you increase the learning rate, that leads to more negative bias or threshold uh, thresholding units. And that leads to better test accuracy as shown on the first plot. To a certain extent, we see this phenomenon in more general settings like classification for CIPAR 10 using Resident 18 architecture. So what we're plotting on the second plot 
is the median bias of this ResNet 18 at the last convolutional layers. And you see that also negative bias or edge detectors arise with larger learning rate. And according to the first plot, that leads to slightly better generalization uh, um, after, after the training. So we see this very interesting phenomenon where in order to learn edge detectors or negative bias of the ReLU network that we consider, it seems that we need large learning rate. And it seems to transfer to more general models. We want to really understand this question, but there's one thing on the way, which is this very unexpected phenomenon that happened, which I showed you earlier, instability. The next question we have is then, do we know anything about this instability? Fortunately to us, actually there's a growing literature on this instability behavior of training neural networks in the literature. And their, their main message is that this kind of instability seems to occur very often in practice and it eludes, it's outside of the scope of the existing analysis of gradient descent. So let me be more clear about this point. To do that, let me first summarize briefly like how the existing gradient descent analysis works. And it's mostly based on how gradient descent behaves on quadratics. So for quadratics, it turns out convergence of gradient descent is equivalent to choosing step size sufficiently small. And uh, by small, I mean less than two over largest eigenvalue of the Hessian of the loss. Let me just quickly illustrate for this 2D quadratics, the lambda max value is 40. And if you choose step size greater than 2 over 40, GD diverges. And if you choose a step size less than 2 over 40, GD converges, as you, as you can see uh, from this illustration. So based on this, for smooth functions, most GD analysis in the literature consider the step size eta less than this 2 over lambda max value. And famous descent lemma shows that when step size chosen this sufficiently small, loss is not uh, monotonically decreasing at each iteration. So what's, what kind of instability was observed in the literature? So let me recall this condition here. So step size is smaller than two over lambda max, or equivalently, you can rearrange to get lambda max is less than two over uh, step size. So this uh, famous work by Jeremy Cohen et al. from 2021 made very interesting film, uh, empirical observation that in most neural network trainings, we typically see this lambda max value actually going beyond two over step size threshold and the loss is behaving non-monotonically. They call this phenomenon edge of stability phenomenon so for example, when you train CIFAR-10 um, with the fully connected uh, architecture using gradient descent, um, you get the following result. So in the plot, there is going to be sharpness. And by sharpness, it is largest eigenvalue of the training loss Hessian. You get this um, striking uh, plot. So the first plot is a training loss. This plot is from this Cohen et al. paper. You see that the training loss is behaving non-monotonically, unlike the wisdom from gradient descent lemma. And when you look at the sharpness value, the second plot, it's actually going beyond this threshold. So for example, focusing on orange curve, which corresponds to step size 2 over 200, the admissible sharpness value, or the lambda max value, is 200. But you see that. This is observed in many, many different settings of neural network training. And right now it's very actively studied in the literature. Then you might ask now, so we have seen that in order to answer our main question of understanding how edge detectors arise for sparse coding, we need to understand some kind of instability happening in the training dynamics. 
or non-convex dynamics. And you might, you might ask right now, then, is this edge of stability phenomenon related to the instability we are looking at? So from here on, uh, my uh, uh, colleague, Felipe, will explain this point. Yeah, so as it turns out, it is, in fact, the edge of stability what helps us um, tackle this question. So let me just um, go back to the, to the picture of the sparse coding problem. So in the first plot, we see that the bias decreases the uh, more the larger the step size. On the middle plot, we see that a combination of the, of the weights uh, moves non-monotonically and actually oscillates. And more strikingly, we see that this sharpness uh, raises and maxes out at around 2 over, over the step size. So this is truly a manifestation of the edge of stability in our simple um, sparse coding problem. Um, but now that leads us to the to the following question. So how do we how do we use the edge of stability here? So in order to use the edge of stability, we need to first understand it. The problem is, is that our understanding of the edge of stability is still quite limited. So when you know when we have uh, limited knowledge about something, what we do is just think about very basic toy toy problems. And um, so in order to do that, we will consider um, a very basic instance of the edge of stability to try to gain some intu in intuitions and see if those intuitions carry over to the more general case. So let's consider perhaps like the, the simplest 2D non-convex function, which is defined as L of x times y. So we'll consider the following um, the following function for L. So L will be our will be a convex even and Lipschitz function. Um, and I'll just list a couple of properties about about this function L of x uh, x times y. Um, first of all, it is a non-convex function, even though L is simple. Uh, the function is still a function of x times y. It is minimized at the x and y axis. This is because L is minimized at zero. Um, if we look at the GD dynamics, we see that indeed um, they follow these equations, and of course, uh, the dynamics of x and y are, are symmetric with, the, with respect to each other, which implies the next property, which is that the, in, that the lines y equals to plus and minus x are invariant lines. So, in particular, we can restrict our analysis to a particular uh, to a particular uh, uh, orthant of the of the of the plane. So. Uh, from now on, we will consider the starting point uh, to be uh, y0 such that it is positive and is greater than x0 in absolute value. Um, with this starting point, uh, we expect the gradient flow to converge to the y-axis. And in that case, we also expect y to be monotonically decreasing. That is why this is because um, the, the gradient distance always the gradient direction is always positive for y in this region. Um, so let's now see how GD converges. Um, so here's here's a picture of, of, of GD. Let's be a little um, a little bit illustrative. Uh, so here's what the gradient flow looks like. It converges converges to the point zero comma square root of y zero squared minus x zero squared. I'll explain a little bit further why that is the case. Now let's look at GD. So for a small step size. Uh, we see the following behavior. GD tracks pretty accurately uh, the gradient flow. Uh, but on the other hand, for large step sizes, we see that initially GD tracks gradient flow up until a point it crosses the y-axis and then starts bouncing back and forth. And when it when y goes below uh, square root of 2 over eta, it starts converging. So let me just give some intuition as to what this, why this is the case. So we have these two clear different regimes based on the step size. You know, on the left is small step size, which essentially tracks rate and flow, and on the right is larger step size. Um, and it, it shows this uh, oscill oscillatory behavior. So as I mentioned, GED initially tracks rate and flow, and that means that we would expect rate and flow to take us to a point x d0, y t0 which is close to the y-axis, um, and specifically close to the point zero squared, the square root of uh, x zero squared minus x zero, x zero squared. Now, at this point, uh, we can actually analyze a little bit more in detail what the G dynamics are by taking linear um, Taylor expansion of L. Uh, 
um, near zero for x. And in that case, we see that the next iterate for x happens to be a scaling of the previous iterate. And the scaling is given by, uh, by some function in, in y. And in specific, it was y minus um, eta y squared. So that gives us already a hint as to what the two regimes are. And indeed, if the step size is below 2 over yt0 squared, we see that the coefficient is less than 1 in absolute value, which means that x decreases more, uh, exponentially fast to 0. Uh, and we call this the gradient flow regime. On the other hand, if the step size is larger than 2 over yt0 squared, then the coefficient is negative and also less than minus 1. And so a, um, x cannot stabilize, even though y, as I already mentioned before, y always keeps decreasing. So what happens in this regime is that x starts bouncing back and forth across the y-axis, and y keeps decreasing um, up, until, up until the coefficient 1 minus, up until the, the value of 1 minus eta y, yt squared becomes less than 1, in which case, as in the previous case, xt starts converging exponentially fast. And we call this the EOS regime. So even though you know, this shows signs of, of, of behaving much like EOS, we haven't actually touched on the, the sharpness. So let me just um, explain why I call this the EOS regime. So first, GD tracks GD uh, gradient flow. And it turns out that the point that it reaches x d0, y d0 is such that the maximum eigenvalue of the Hessian at that point is approximately y0 squared minus x0 squared. So essentially, the fact that the step size is larger than 2 over y0 squared minus x0 squared is saying um, that approximately the step size is larger than 2 over the, over the, over the sharpness or over the max. So in summary, we can compile these results in the following theorems. So suppose we initialize GD at x0, y0. If the step size is below 2 over y0 squared minus x0 squared, then our final value for, for y will be essentially y0 squared minus x0 squared up to a constant. Whereas if the step size is larger than 2 over y0 squared minus x0 squared, then the final value of y squared will be below 2 over eta. And actually, we can control how far can it go beyond 2 over eta. And, and in, in this particular case, it will be just be constant factor. But as it turns out, we can, we can prove a more general um, uh, control over the gap uh, of how far y goes beyond 2 over eta. And that, that essentially is achieved by, and by doing a more careful analysis of the Taylor expansion of L around the origin. So if we, if we know that L satisfies this local condition, then we can prove that we can improve the, our, our edge of stability uh, uh, gap um, by, by, this, by this factor. Um, so essentially, we, um, we tackle like different, you know, different possible losses uh, with, 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 varying, uh, with varying behaviors around the origin. In particular, we see for beta equals to 2, it reduces to the last, to the, to the previous uh, statement. And this is the case for the logistic function or for the, or for the square root loss. But our, our theorem also applies to more general loss, uh, losses, such as for the Huber loss, Huber loss um, in which case beta takes the value of infinity. Now, at this point, we have pretty much already like, gained a lot of intuition about um, how this edge of stability behaves um, for this simple 2D function. But now the goal is to try and leverage these intuitions uh, to say more about the sparse coding problem. Um, so now we'll hand it over back to Kwang Jun. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so, so far, as Philippe has summarized, we resort to a very simple toy model to understand the working mechanism of the edge of stability. And let's see how this intuition can help us answer our main question of decreasing bias, how the, uh, bias decreases or how threshold neurons arise in sparse coding problem. But some of you guys might have noticed some similarity between our sparse coding example and this L of x times y example. Did anyone notice anything 
similar. So to see the similarity, let's actually consider the dynamics of like the sparse coding problem. Uh, um, in terms of this A, which is the sum of the last layer weights and the bias. If you plot the dynamics, you actually see this behavior where the along the A, it's oscillating wildly and it results in some decrease in bias. This resembles a lot the picture we saw from L of X times Y example, where in the along the X axis, it's oscillating and along the Y axis, it's decreasing. So from these two pictures, you, you might, you might no, uh, notice that there might be some similarity between the two cases. Actually, it turns out this intuition we gain from L of X times Y analysis is exactly what we need. It turns out after some approximations, we can approximate the GD dynamics of the sparse coding problem by the GD dynamics on this loss function, where the loss function is L of the sum of weights times D times G of D, where G is the nonlinear function, you can basically regard it as smooth ReLU. So to make the connection between this and L of X times Y more explicit, let me just rewrite the cost function or re, uh, in terms of A and B, then the dynamics, approximate dynamics becomes the rescale gradient descent on this loss function, A comma B to L of A times G B. So now the connection between the previous case and this um, sparse coding problem becomes clearer. Now the cost function or the GD dynamics for the sparse coding problem essentially reduces to GD dynamics or risk scale GD dynamics on this L of A times GB. From this on, we're gonna call this GD dynamics, approximate GD dynamics, the mean model. And we're gonna focus on analyzing the dynamics in terms of A and B. And in fact, the mean model is a really good approximation for the GD dynamics for the sparse coding problem as shown in the following plot. So we're plotting a dynamics of B and A. So uh, dotted lines are the dynamics of the mean model. And the solid lines are dynamics of the actual gradient descent for the sparse coding problem. And you see that mean model very closely tracks the GD dynamics of the sparse coding problem. So we're gonna focus on analyzing the behavior of the, this mean model based on the intuition we gained from the analysis of L X times Y. So because of the great similarity between the two cases, our proof techniques for L, L of X times Y also applies here. What was the summary of the analysis for L of X times Y? We saw that if the step size is smaller than some threshold, then gradient descent tracks gradient flow and converges to where gradient flow converges. And when the step size is larger than some threshold, then gradient descent dynamics tracks the gradient flow until it hits the y-axis and it starts oscillating. So similar principle applies here. It turns out the mean model initialized at a0, where a0 is on the order of one, approximately reaches 0, 0,0, which is where gradient flow converges to, and whose sharpness is is equal to d square over four pi. So now, now the question becomes whether step size is smaller or larger than two over this sharpness value, which the threshold becomes a pi over d square. When step size is less than this a pi over d square value, then mean model converges to where gradient flow converges to, which is corresponds to bias being negative. So bias doesn't move. And if step size is greater than this 
threshold, a pi over d squared, then just like the case of the L x times y case, the mean model start, start, starts bouncing across the b axis and the b bias starts decreasing until it becomes strictly negative. More precisely, the bias becomes negative until this condition is met. So based on this uh, L of X times Y analysis, we can understand this question and the, the main results can be summarized as follows. So if the step size was smaller than A pi over D square, the limiting bias is on the order of minus big O of one over D square. So limiting bias when D is uh, sufficiently large is not um, is approximately equal to zero. But when you step, choose the step size greater than a pi over d square, then the limiting bias becomes strictly negative, more precisely until um, this condition is met. And for instance, if you choose step size 10 pi over d square, this final bias becomes minus uh, some strictly negative number. So this theorem, also explains the phase transition phenomenon that we saw earlier, where before this step size a pi over d square, final bias wasn't sufficiently negative. And after this threshold, the bias becomes much more negative. So let me conclude this talk with some summary of this work. So we present, focus on this problem of how the edge detectors arise we present the first explanation for how the threshold neuron or negative bias arises in models like sparse scoring problem. Um, quite surprisingly, the answer is related to the popular topic of study in the literature, the edge of stability phenomenon. So threshold neurons arise with edge of stability, and we saw this instability in this training dynamics. To understand this, we did some principal analysis of edge of stability for this toy model of L of X times Y and gained intuitions from that model. And it's actually precisely the intuitions we gained from the model that we were able to answer the main question of this work, how threshold neuron arises. So this is the end of our presentation and thank you for listening. <laughs>